we want to reach our target. Our target is a comet. The team has expectation from you every day, and you always have to think ahead. You cannot come in the morning and say, what do we have to do today? You always have to think well ahead. If Rosetta doesn't wake up, our mission will already be over. Our fingers are crossed for the first signal to make it to Earth. On the day of hibernation exit, there was high expectation that we'd successfully come out of hibernation. When that time in the morning occurred, you think, well, okay, that's it now, now we just wait. So you wait for the spacecraft to stop spinning, to, to warm itself up and to get ready to send this signal. Hello everybody and welcome inside the main control room, which is quite exciting. We also get a good view of the countdown clock here before Rosetta will wake up. It requires 45 minutes for the signal to travel at the speed of light to come from the spacecraft to us. That's a big success for everybody. Now we got it back. Now it's up to us to drive it to the comet. You want to see this clean peak, and that's what we got. We, you wait a few more seconds and you see this clean carrier signal, and that's all you need to know. We have no idea what is waiting for us out there. Rosetta will use its navigation camera as it gradually closes in on its target, Comet Churyumov-Gerasimenko, before shifting to the trajectory that will finally bring it to its destination. Then it will start to orbit the comet, map it and characterize it. This will enable us to search for a landing site and land the Philae lander in November 2014. Philae is the part of the Rosetta mission that will land on the comet. So we will really have the opportunity to investigate the primordial dust and ice material on site. You've got to watch yourself here. This is what we're looking at. 50% of the comet's going to be made of material like this. We can look at the water on the ocean of the Earth and compare that ratio to what we find on comets, whether it's like sheet ice or it's more dusty ice. Possibly this water could have been delivered to the Earth by the comets. This is why we're going to this comet, to see where that water comes from, to see is it connected to Earth at all. And that's then connecting to whether we ourselves are, are connected to comets maybe, who knows. With this mission, we're entering new territory. In Berlin, we have built three instruments for this lander. The Rollis camera on the bottom of the lander will acquire six or seven images that will reach Earth hours later. The Mupus device will be hammered into the surface to measure the thermal properties. These will then be refined using the other instruments to understand what kind of environment we've landed on. The spacecraft is now on a trajectory to the comet, but it doesn't have yet the right velocity to actually arrive at the comet and stay there. We activate our thrusters, the, the, the small rockets we have on board, and we accelerate the spacecraft to reach the exact velocity of the comet. And we do an acceleration of about 800 meters per second. It's a lot of acceleration. We start to see this pinprick in the distance and then you realise this is reality. It's not a theoretical concept anymore, it's a real comet. We're seeing this, this pinpoint of light getting closer and closer. It wasn't like this grey potato that we first imagined, that it was actually much more interesting. It consists of two parts. This double structure was not expected, and we all had the same initial thought. How will we land on this? It hasn't made things any easier.
We don't want Philae to end up on its back like a beetle or to crash. All these things are much easier to solve on a spherical target than on a very rugged surface with valleys, even canyons, cliffs and crevices. These are difficult conditions. Therefore, we have a ground reference model here at the Lander Control Center to test all the sequences over and over again. It takes some time, but we have to make sure that it works. The landing sequence will be started at a specific moment. At the same time, the orbiter must adopt a specific orientation as the lander will be pushed away from the orbiter. As soon as the lander's feet touch the surface, two harpoons will be fired to anchor it. To further secure the lander, ice screws on the feet will then draw it towards the surface. One must prepare as best one can. We will spend the time in characterizing the comet. We have the faintest idea of the gravity potential of the comet, of the gravitational forces. So we have to measure them and then we can orbit the comet. And there we will start mapping it. We need to do a very good map to decide where to land. All this we have to do it before, otherwise we are not even able to discuss about lander delivery. So it's a massive challenge technologically, but at the same time, the reason we're at this comet is for science. No other reason. We're doing this to get the best science, to characterize this comet as has never been done before. What will be interesting for the scientists will be to observe the changes. What the comet does as it approaches the sun, becomes increasingly active and starts to outgas and form jets. Parts of the comet's surface are dead and inactive. Nothing is happening. And there are some places where plenty is going on now. At the moment, some 500 grams of water per second are outgassing from the comet. Closer to the sun, this will rise to 300 kilograms. What would happen if the lander were to touch down in one of these places? It would probably not guarantee a long operating life. If we target an active area, an area where there's lots of outgassing sublimation, so lots of material coming off of the surface, it's going to be difficult to get the lander down there. After considering all the different aspects of the possible landing sites, we have decided on landing site J. We've also selected an alternative landing site C on the body. This undertaking is so complex that a single person would be overwhelmed by it. It simply isn't manageable. It's only possible in large teams. You have to get together and discuss. And the good thing is that they're all great people, people with their feet on the ground who you can really talk to. It presents particular challenges, but ultimately Rosetta shows you what you can do by collaborating internationally. It's just great to be here. It's great to be involved in this and, and be involved with the scientists, the guys that are doing this. To be able to interact with people like that is, that's it. You can imagine how privileged we feel to be the ones to have to land this object on the comet. But at the same time, you can understand the level of responsibility that sits on our, or lands onto our shoulders. We've spent years with the colleagues of the lander team mainly the colleagues from CNES and DLR, to work out strategies, to redefine them, to trade them off, to negotiate them, to fit all the constraints and the objectives we have for this operation phase. And now we have to implement it for real. Time has come to, to make it happen. Activation. Characterize the power.